just like to introduce yourself. Okay. You asked for an old fusilier, I'm a very old fusilier. Yeah. Um, my name is George Percifer, and my rank when I left the army was Lieutenant Colonel. Okay, just to start off, when and where were you born? London, in 1927. Was any of your family in the f army? My father was in the army for a short time as a conscript during the war. Did it encourage you to join? No. No? Um, why did you join the, air uh, the army cadets at such an early age? How do you know I joined the army cadets? Because I've been doing research. <laughs> I joined the army cadets at 13. Um, the way I'm meeting girls. Yeah. <laughs> um, you become a regular fusilier at the age of 17. Um, how long were you a fusilier for? Six weeks. Seriously, six weeks. I joined the training battalion in Inverness, and training battalions were an organisation that took potential leaders, and they had six months training instead of the usual three months. And I got there because of my service in the cadets when I was a corporal in the cadets. And in the training battalions, after six weeks, they made two men in each platoon, what they called the recruit lance corporals, and I was one of them. So after six weeks, I put a stripe up. And um, in fact, rather strange because there was a chap in my platoon called Perfect, and Perfect and Pettif were always getting mixed up. Yeah. And I went on a route march one day and heard the sergeant talk to the um, two officers behind me, saying they got it wrong, sir. It was Pettif was supposed to get the stripe, not Perfect. As a result of that, poor Perfect had to take down his stripe, and Pettif had put it up, so Pettif was on the call. What would you say an average day of training was like? What would I say? What? An average day of training was like. Oh. Incredibly hard. Mm. Um, the first thing, it started with rebellion, and someone coming around and shaking the bed and getting you up. Then you had to lay out every bit of kit you had on your bed in perfect order. You had to fold up now. Everything you had was marked with your number. And you had to, for instance, the blankets had to be folded. And when you first got them, you'd sewn on a thing, giving the name and number. And you had to fold the blankets in boxes, they call them, like squares. So this little label was in the front. You had to lay out everything you had. In fact, um, I can still sing the small rhyme. It went, knife, fork, spoon, a razor, comb, a lather, brush, toothbrush, and button stick. That's how it used to be laid out. Knife, fork, spoon, razor, comb, and lather, brush, toothbrush, and button stick. And if you didn't have them in that order, They'd probably pick them up and throw them on the floor as they do it again. <coughs> in fact, the um, kit inspections were so bad that when you had a big kit inspection by the company commander on Saturday morning, one laid all the kit out on the bed on Friday night and slept on the floor because you knew you weren't going to have time to do it perfectly before the inspection the next day. Would you like to say some stuff about the fitness training and the aspects of that? I found that very hard indeed because I've never been a great sportsman. Um, I've never liked sport very much. And my father said to me once, George, if ever you feel the need for violent exercise, go and lie down, it will pass. And that's how I felt. I didn't, want to, I didn't like exercise at all. So I found that particularly hard. I particularly found being made to do team sports particularly hard because I'm no good at them. In fact, in self-defence, I eventually became a hockey umpire because um, I knew I had to do something and I wasn't going to um, run around kicking a ball or more likely missing it. So I became an umpire. In your army career, you was basically the Tower of London for a bit. Um, what did you do whilst you were there? Well, I was a company sergeant major here and 56 years ago, I brought my 17-year-old bride to come and live here. Um, as I say, I was, I was 28, she was 17. I brought her to live here and we lived in the block next to here, the big block, beautiful flat. And I, my job was to train soldiers. And two of the soldiers I attempted to train were twins called Cray. Have you heard of Crays? Yes, I did Crays. Well, in those days, the custom was that if soldiers were called up and they didn't appear, they were absent without leave. And they had to appear in front of magistrates if they were arrested. And the magistrate would say, yes, we find you are absentees. 
and then the police would ring the local unit and say, come and pick them up. And I got the phone call to go and pick them up. And usually it was a case of sending a corporal and a couple of soldiers. But I thought, I've never seen the procedure, so I'll do this myself. So although it's a sergeant major, I was far too senior really to do it. I went to this police station somewhere in the east of London, and they were handed over to me. And I handcuffed each of the Cray twins to one of the two soldiers. We got on the train, and we got off the train at Liverpool Street here. And um, one of the Cray twins said, you see those people over there? And I looked down at the end of the platform, they were about eight or nine, and I said yes. And he said, that's my mother and a couple of uncles and some friends. We released the handcuffs so we could go and say goodbye. And I looked at this crowd looking at me and thought, if I let go of these hand let out of the handcuffs, I'm never going to see them again. Then I saw the way they were looking at me and thought, if I don't take the handcuffs off, we're going to get done here and we're far outnumbered. So much against the rules and against um, my own feelings, I did release the handcuffs and they went over. And much to my surprise, five minutes later, the mother brought them back, one in each hand, and handed them over. And they put the cuffs back on, put them in the nick, which is under the coat tower. So, you know, it was a dead cert court martial if I'd lost them, but I hadn't. So that was one of the things I did as a sergeant major. Would you say that was a good experience, or...? It was a worrying experience, yes. Yes. Well, after you was at the tower, you moved on to do some active service. We. You went out to Korea. Were, were you feeling nervous or any emotions on the boat out to Korea? No, I was lucky in that I was on the advance party, so there was only a few of us. I wasn't with the battalion, so I didn't have anything to do. And I didn't feel nervous, no, I didn't. I can't remember what I thought, but it's probably entirely a military thing, because on the boat was an 18-year-old girl who was going out to join her parents in Hong Kong. And on day two of a six-week trip, we got together. So it was a very, very nice six weeks for cruise with a pretty girl. You would gather from what I told you that I wasn't mad at that time. So, it was right. so the trip was, no, a bit apprehensive, but more apprehensive when I landed. What role did you play in Korea? I went to Korea as a sergeant. Um, We've got things out of order here, of course, because we went from the tower where I was stationed to Korea, and in fact Korea came first, but it doesn't matter. Um, I went there as a sergeant, I was promoted to um, colour sergeant or staff sergeant, then I was a company sergeant major, and for a while I was a platoon commander, commanding a platoon of 30 men during the Korean War. So, um, what were the conditions like out there? Pretty horrible, let me tell you, for instance. Um, in the winter, it was so cold that the vehicles had to be moved every half an hour. Just moved a bit and back because their wheels froze to the ground. And before we did that, we weren't used to winter. When the first really hard frost came, someone tried to drive away a jeep and it left its tyres on the ground. It just stripped the tyres off because of the cold. Um, we used to live in dugouts, rather like the first World War you've seen in trenches. It was like that. And, um, if you were on duty on the front line as a sentry, um, the platoon commander, or in my case the platoon sergeant, would go around with a tot of rum halfway through your, you did one hour on that sort, and halfway through it, someone would bring you a tot of rum. It was so freezing cold, terribly cold. And then of course there was the fact that um, you were patrolling in the valley against Chinese soldiers who were very, very good indeed. Absolutely incredible soldiers. So what rank were you when you went out to? I went out to Korea as a sergeant and got promoted twice there, so I came back as a company sergeant major. How long did it take you before coming in lieutenant colonel then? God. I was a company sergeant major at 24. It took me another 20 years. 44. A bit less than that. Maybe 18, no, 20 years ago, because I had to go through every rank. And most officers are commissioned, are, uh, as soon as they start, they go to Sandhurst. Um, but I failed um, a test for Sandhurst, so I had to do it the hard way. 
and I held every rank between private, corporal, sergeant, sergeant major, regimental sergeant major, lieutenant, captain, until colonel. So that's how long it took, basically. Would you have said it was it harder being a private or a lower rank than a higher rank, such as a lieutenant colonel? Oh no, the higher you got, the better it was. All right. Because the higher you got, the more people you could tell what to do, and the fewer could tell you what to do. Mm. So you was in charge more. I was in charge more. Yeah. Um, can you remember the first time you had to discipline a soldier? I don't think I can. I mean, once you get to Lance Corporal, you're doing it all the time. My brother was in the regiment, and I remember I had to discipline very severely once. And he told my mother, and she told me off. I was a sergeant then, and he was a, a private. And but my mother gave me hell because I'd um, told off her, her darling younger son. Would you have said it was hard leading a group of fusiliers? Of course it is, the responsibility, no matter, if you're only a last corporal, you look after seven men, it's the responsibility is always something that equals to your lieutenant colonel leading 800. Very severe responsibility, being responsible for men.